I don't know if I've given a personal shout out to Curtis on over there on the keys, just killing it. Um, freshman in high school. Um, we figured out he was a prodigy actually at the Oak Bridge City Edge, which is a perfect segue into talking about the Edge at Oak Bridge City. It's going to be a really fun night. We're very, very excited. And really the way that we have done kind of student ministry for years, and we, we really want to do our best to create environments for you to grow in your relationship with Jesus and make this your consistent home. But there are also some events that we want to hype a little bit more, where we're going to share the message of Jesus, where we're going to do a lot of the same stuff, but maybe it's maybe more appealing to your friends. And I believe this is one of those edges. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some games. It's at a great venue. How many of you guys were at the Oak Bridge City uh, Edge last time we had it there? Was it cool? Just round of applause. It was a great night. It was one of my favorite edges ever. And so I really, really do. We're going to be putting out some promotional stuff on Instagram and on social media. And I would just ask that you guys share it. It's going to be, um, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, anyways, I'm excited to be here tonight though. I'm fired up about it. We're back for part four of Normal Isn't Working. Uh, the first week, I'm going to kind of catch you up on it. Uh, the first week we, we, we chatted about how we aren't really to live for the approval of other people. When we live for the approval of other people, we make some decisions that really probably aren't the decisions that God wants us to make and it leads to regret and it leads to shame and it leads to a lack of influence in the world around you. So we don't want you to live for the approval of others. We want you to live from the approval of God, understanding that Jesus has already approved of me. He smiles on me. He calls me his daughter. He calls me his son. Therefore, I'm gonna love him. I'm gonna honor him to the point where I can, like, like Paul says in Philippians chapter one, for me to live as Christ. For me, every area of my life is going to have Jesus on it. What a way, what a way to live. Easier said than done, but that would be pretty extraordinary. Second week, uh, Trey spoke, did a great job, talked about how we need to value, yeah, yeah, we need to talk, we need to value the interests of others more than the interests that, that, that we have in our lives. We need to live lives of self-sacrifice, okay, think about this, like what would it be like if you went to school every day, middle school, high school, and said, I'm going to serve people. I'm just going to serve people. That's going to be my priority. And if you've been following along with the normal, isn't we working devotional and listening to some of the uh, some of the live at nines, which have been a, a lot of fun, uh, at least for the leaders, it's been a great time. Uh, although a lot of you students have stuck with us. Zach Case has been very consistent with the SK, SK, SK. Okay, it's been extraordinary. Um, and and so, so you've had some challenges in that devotional to pick somebody's lunch up, dirty tray, and go throw it away. You've had some challenges to go sit by people on a lunch table where maybe they don't have a lot of friends. And we've asked you to be bold and go serve someone in that way. And then last week we talked about how we aren't to revolve our lives around anything or anyone other than Jesus. And when we do, they always disappoint. They always promise a whole lot and they always under deliver. They do. They're fake. They're frauds. They're counterfeit gods that will never ever fill you up in the way that you desire to be filled up. So you need to revolve your life around Jesus. And let me just say that none of that's normal. Week one wasn't normal. Week two was revolutionary. It's radical. It's not normal. Last week is not normal. It's not. But normal isn't working. Normal's not working. And so tonight's not going to be normal either. But again, normal isn't working. That's right. All right. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go pretty quick. Okay, I'm going to go quick tonight. I'm going to try and start making my edge talks not so long. I'm trying to do it. I'm getting better at it. But I want you guys to give me 15 minutes, okay? And so I'm looking at you. It doesn't look like any of you are on your phone. I don't want your phones out. If you have your phone out, be taking notes. Otherwise, I, can, I think if you're going to come to church, we can ask for 15 minutes off your phone. Sound good? Y'all with me? All right, here we go. We're going we're gonna to share three R words that Paul shares in Philippians chapter 4. Week 1, we went in chapter 1. Two, two, three, three, you get it. So we're on chapter four, and, and we're sharing three R words that Paul, I think, challenges us to incorporate into our day-to-day -day lives. I could have done four, but three is, three is better. Okay, so here we go. Um, we're going to look at Philippians chapter four, verses four through nine, and it says this. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. 
And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And then I think this is super practical as we kind of end our 28-day journey in the book of Philippians. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, Paul says, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. So the first R word, you'll never guess it, is rejoice. Okay, rejoice. It's the first word that we just read in that passage. He says, as Jesus followers, he says to the church in Philippi, he says to people just like us, you need to live a life of rejoicing. You ever, do you know anybody, like when you think of that, like do you think, okay, that reminds me of that person. Like someone always just has a lot of joy. Someone always seems to be rejoicing. Someone always seems to be positive. Someone always seems to be celebrating. There's a guy who really comes to my mind. He's an older guy at the church here. And every time I ask him how he's doing, I go up to, how you doing? How you doing? Every single time. It's always kind of the same thing. God is good. Oh, God's so good. God's so great. Like, you know, Jesus is doing some crazy stuff in me. He's doing some crazy stuff around me. He's doing some crazy stuff through me. Josh, he's doing crazy stuff through me. He can do crazy stuff through me. This is awesome. He tells me stories all the time. My wife's great. My grandkids are so much fun. Jesus is so good. I love this church. Everything's awesome. And I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, yeah, I know people like that, too, who are kind of fake. And they act like everything's just perfect and great and they've never made a mistake and everything's awesome and everything's just, you know, rainbows and ice cream. And I don't know why I use <laughs> those two words. It's not in the notes. But who doesn't love a good rainbow after a storm? And who doesn't love ice cream, right? Okay, those are two pretty cool things, right? And I know what some of you are thinking. I know people like that. They put on a facade, they post the, the best pictures, they talk about the best things, and they just never actually acknowledge that they have stuff, that they have issues. You don't know Danny like I know Danny, all right? Don't judge Danny. You don't know him, right? Like, like, like he'll talk about junk. He'll say, yeah, my wife has this heart, heart problems, heart murmur, and can't really get out of bed on some days. He'll talk about the brokenness in our world. He'll talk about the struggles in his own life. But there's always a common theme because he understands something that Paul says very clearly in Philippians chapter 4. We need to rejoice when everything's going great and when our circumstances are awesome. No, that's not what Paul says. Paul says you rejoice and you rejoice always because the foundation of why you rejoice is not in your circumstances because how many of y'all know your circumstances, your circumstances change. He says rejoice in the Lord because he never changes. He's always good. And he's always holy, and he's always just, and he's always gracious and kind and merciful and patient with us. So we always have a reason to rejoice. And, and, and let me just say this. When you rejoice, it's just attractive. It's, it's, it's just attractive. It's holy. It's different. It's set apart. Like, if you rejoice rather than complaining, like, you honestly, Scripture says this, you shine like stars in the universe because normal isn't working, but normal isn't, or because com complaining's normal and normal isn't working, I think is what I was trying to say. But, but you guys get the picture. Like, 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 complaining, it's normal. Being negative, it's normal. But it's just not working. How many of you guys have ever said, I'm just going to get it off my chest, and then, you, and, then you, and then you decide just to vomit, excuse my language, but just vomit out a bunch of negative stuff? Has anybody ever said that? I'm just going to get this off my chest. I can't stand this person. I can't stand that person. So much homework. So stressed. Don't like my boss. My friends are talking bad about me, this, that, my parents are driving me crazy. Has anybody ever said that? I'm just going to get this off my chest. I need to get it off my chest. H hear me, fam. You aren't getting anything off your chest. You're driving it down deeper into your chest, and all you're doing is becoming a more negative person. Negativity always breeds more negativity. So, 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 so Paul says, rejoice, and rejoice when? Always. So tonight, the first question, I want you guys to think about it right now. We're gonna, what, what's something you can celebrate in your life right now? We're going to celebrate in small groups. What's something you can celebrate? What's, some, what's something that's good? And if you can't think of anything in your life, if you can't think of anything in your family, your school, this or that, I'm guessing you probably could. But if not, Paul says, that's okay. I'm in prison unjustly. I was arrested. 
I'm, 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 I don't know if I'm going to die, but I have the Lord, and he's good. Rejoice. Next, relax. Relax. The next R word is relax. I love the passage where, where we talked about it. It said, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. I love that verse. Some of you are like, okay, yeah, I like the verse too, but where do you get the word relax? Okay, well, let me kind of make this a little more plain here, okay? The Lord is near, okay? If you're a Jesus follower, if you're a Christian, if you've been saved by grace, which just means if you've simply believed in Jesus, that he is who he says he is, that he died for you, that he rose from the dead, that he loves you, that he, that he has the power to save you from your sin, if, you're accepted, if you've been accepted in the family of God, the Lord is near. That's what Paul says. He's with you. He's for you. He fights for you. And scripture says, if God is for you, who can be against you? Scripture says that he works all things together for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. The Lord is near, and because of that, you need to let your gentleness be evident to all. What does that mean? This word gentleness is probably better translated as you need to let your calm be evident to all. You need to let your 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 peace be evident to all. You need to let your gentle spirit be evident to all. When everyone else is freaking out, when the world's going crazy, when we're making rash decisions, saying stuff, being afraid, all these different things, Paul says, no, 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 relax. The Lord is near. I love what one theologian says in regards to this word uh, gentleness that we just read. This word describes the heart of a person who will let the Lord fight his battles. It describes a person who is really free to let go of his anxieties and all the things that cause him stress because he knows the Lord will take up his cause. So when it would be easy to freak out, when it would be easy to get scared because of something that you see on the news and like just like start fearing for your life, when it would be easy to get really angry at a friend that said something bad about you behind your back, when it would be really easy to like panic and think that you blew everything after you make a mistake or jump into sin, when, when it would be really, really easy to again like become afraid and kind of become panicky when the world seems to be kind of sketchy out there and things are difficult and we're living in some crazy times, all this, when it would be easy for you to freak out, he says, hey, 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 be gentle. Be gentle in spirit. Relax. Understand that the Lord is near. Give those things to him and he will take up your cause. He'll take up your cause. And so now we don't have to retaliate when someone says something bad about us. We, we don't have to get angry and defensive when someone says something that might challenge what we believe to be true. We don't need to get super mad when we read something on social media and like something that you know, we disagree with or whatever it is. No, no. We, can, we can just relax. The Lord is near. He's got it under control. He sits on the throne. And lastly, we need to retreat. We need to retreat. How many of you guys like storms? Anybody like storms? Honestly, there's something about storms, and I'm not a huge nature guy, but I, I love when, when I'm like laying in bed early in the morning, and I don't really have anywhere to be for a couple hours or whatever, and it's raining outside. Like, it's kind of gloomy, even if a little light thunder every now and then, I kind of like crack in the window if it's cool outside, and I just think it's peaceful. I think it brings tranquility, which is a great word, into my world, and, and I, just, I just like it, okay? And part of me, and you know, I don't like driving it or anything like that, but I kind of like like the real big storms. Anybody kind of like enjoy the big storms, Okay. Like take, for instance, when a tornado is on the way, okay, and you hear a tornado siren, okay, and I'm not being insensitive if you've ever been impacted by a tornado, you guys know this is true. In the Midwest, you hear the sirens a lot, and the news, the people on the news, the weathermen will be like, y'all need to go down in the basement. What do we do? We open the front door. How's it look, right? Like those weathermen are never right, right, you know, and so we we look at it like, wow, this looks great. The sky, the wind, you know, there's something about it. But then when the threat gets real, when we understand that this threat is a, it's a real threat, what do we do? 
we retreat. We get in the basement. If the threat's real, if the, if the threat's dangerous, if the threat's powerful, we retreat. In fact, it was a few months ago, some of you guys in the St. Louis metro area, there was a tornado that I think touched down in Washington, Missouri, or something like that, Wildwood or something. And if you were in the St. Louis metro area and not down super far south, you knew that this was like, this had a potential to where something might actually happen. And so it was the first time, honestly, in a long time where Abby and I actually went down to the basement. I was texting Carrie, who was babysitting our nieces, go down the basement, right? Get down there. Why? There's a threat. And it needed to be neutralized. And Paul says, Paul says, he makes it really clear. There's a threat. There's a threat in your life. And you guys know this. Middle schoolers, high schoolers, especially in 2019 in the United States of America, there's the threat and it's like angst. Anxieties, worries, stress, busyness, the rat race of, you know, trying to be cool and trying to be awesome and all the while maybe trying to follow Jesus if we want to and it's just stressful and it's burdensome and it's anxious and our brains never turn off and we're on social media and we're thinking, we're thinking, who are we going to be? How are we going to act? How are we going to post? And then I got grades and then I got work and I got to make money and I got to do all these different things. And Paul says it's a threat. And he says, hey, if anxiety is a threat, if you're not going to be anxious about anything, you better pray about everything. If you're not going to be anxious about anything, you better pray about anything that you're tempted to be anxious about. You need to, you need to pray. It's funny. Scripture says that, that our God is a, is a refuge. He's a, he's a mighty fortress. He's a shelter. We can, we can rest in the shadow of his wings. We can hide under the shadow of his wings. Essentially, I believe Paul is saying, hey, 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 you need to fight to retreat. You need to fight to turn down the, 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 the noise in this world, and you need to fight to retreat to turn up the voice of God in your life. There is a threat, and it needs to be neutralized. And it happens from retreating. Well, where do you see that? Well, we need to retreat for two different things. We need to retreat to pray. You need to retreat to pray. You do. You do. If it's big enough to stress about, it's, it's, it's definitely big enough to pray about. If it's big enough to worry about, it's big enough to pray about. And for a lot of us, we have things in our lives that we've been worrying about for months and we never prayed about them. We wonder why we're still worrying. Says so you need to retreat to pray. And let me just say this. I think a lot of times we're going to talk about this. I actually read some really good things by the prayer team. They're going to talk about it next week, I think on Sunday morning. Like a lot of times when you say, when I say prayer, when you hear a pastor say, y'all need to pray, that brings anxiety. I don't know how to do that. Like praying should be simple. Praying is just talking to God. It's talking to God. You don't know what prayer is. It's talking to God. It's simple, but it does not come naturally. It doesn't, especially if you don't do it very often. It doesn't come naturally. God is invisible. God has chosen to, to, to remain invisible. And so why do I say retreat? Because you have to, otherwise you won't pray. He, you, need, you need to think of, of, of a specific time to be really practical in your day, middle schooler, high schooler, leader, Josh Noblet. You, you need to think of a specific time in your day and probably think of a specific place. And you need to go there. Maybe it's just before your bed. It doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be a war room closet. It doesn't need to be that stuff. But you need to retreat. You need to get your phone out of there. If you're, you get your phone away from you. Be alone. Turn off the noise of this world to where you can have a conversation and hear the voice of God. You, you need to retreat to, to pray. And then lastly, Paul says you need to retreat to think. You need to retreat to think. Here's something that we're going to close with this, all right? So zone in. If you're zoned out, we got one and a half more minutes, okay? Your thoughts, your thoughts affect your, and this is obvious, you guys know this. They affect your emotions. They, they definitely 100% affect your affections. And, and they affect your beliefs. And your emotions, your affections, and your beliefs determine your decisions. And your decisions essentially determine who you're going to be in this world. So if you're living a life where you know this is not the life I'm called to live, this is not who I'm called to be, most of the time it can be traced back to a what? A thought. 
a thought, a thought that you allowed to creep in, or a bunch of thoughts that you allowed to creep in, and then it ended up shaping your affections, it shaped your beliefs, it shaped your emotions, and then you started making decisions that impacted your life in a really negative direction. Paul says, if you want to be transformed, if you want to be transformed into the image of Jesus, do you know what you need to do? You need to be renewed. How? You need to, be, you need to, you need to have a renewing of your mind. You need to have a renewing of your thoughts. For some of y'all, you got to quit listening to the music you're listening to all the time. For some of you, you're afraid, you're scared, you're anxious, and you're watching crime shows on Netflix all the time. Got to stop doing it. Right? Like, for a lot of us, we, 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 you know, are treating girls in a way that we shouldn't treat them. For a lot of us, we're, we're viewing the opposite sex in a way that we shouldn't view them, and we're listening to rap music, that is, that they, or whatever music, not just rap. There's some good clean rap, too, by the way, so I'm not hating on rap. But, you know, whatever music you name it, where it's just, it's obsessed with sex. It's sex-saturated, and we're wondering why we're thinking all these thoughts about other people. We gotta stop thinking these thoughts. And, and here's, you're, you're in control of your own mind. You're in control of what comes in here, you are. So you need to retreat to think. You need to think about anything that is excellent or praiseworthy. Whatever's right, whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's honorable. You need to think about these things. Do you know, do you know who personifies all these things? Do you know who personifies all these things? Jesus, right? He's always the answer. Jesus does. You you need to retreat to think about Jesus. You do. For For some of us, the only time we even think about Jesus is this night right here. We can't. If we want to become more like Jesus, we got to think about him. Another way to put this whole thoughts thing is, is your life is going to follow your thoughts. Your life follows your thoughts. The direction of your life follows the direction of your thoughts. And so you need to think about Jesus. You do. Who is he? What's his grace about? What's his kindness about? How's how's he love people? How's he care about people? How much does he love me? You know why? Because, again, the direction of your life will follow the direction of your thoughts. And if you're thinking about Jesus, guess who you're going to follow? Jesus. This is so important. This is not normal. We, we, live in a, we live in a culture where we're nervous, where we're anxious, where we're afraid, where we're, where we're living lives that we aren't called to live, where we have anxieties. And I'm not just speaking to the people who are like, yeah, I, I'm, clinically I've been diagnosed with anxiety. All of us have tendencies to, to be anxious. We do. And if you've been diagnosed with that stuff, absolutely get professional help. Go to a counselor, do the medication thing, all that stuff. I'm an advocate for that. But for a lot of us, we do it we, when it comes to this whole, oh, I got to pray, I got to do this, I got to do that. For a lot of us, we're like, oh, it's just fine. We, we literally view it the same way we do tornadoes. Ah, it's never happened before. Everyone else is doing it. Everyone else has worries. Everyone else is a little bit anxious, right? Everyone else is a little bit afraid. No, it's a threat. It's a threat. It's a threat, and it needs to be neutralized. And the only way that it's going to be neutralized is by retreating and spending time with your Savior. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and uh, we're, we're grateful just for your truth and um, for these three words that don't come naturally to me, for these three words that probably don't come naturally to many of us. And so we ask you for help in these areas. Father, I pray that we can live lives where we do rejoice, where we celebrate. Uh, we celebrate the little things in our lives. We, we celebrate the, the, you know, the, the sporting events, and we celebrate our friendships, and we celebrate our family, and we celebrate the, the fact that we get to eat good food and have good time with friends and all these different things. But first and foremost, I pray that we can celebrate you, that we can rejoice in the Lord because there's, all, there's, there's more than enough that he embodies that should bring about celebration and rejoicing in my life and in our lives. And Father, I pray that for a lot of us, we can begin to, uh, we can begin to relax. We can begin to, to just trust you, that our gentleness can be evident to all. And when people think, wow, why, why, why? There's, some, there's something seems to be different about them, seem to be calm, 
They don't seem to react harshly to people. They don't seek vengeance. They, they, they seem to have a peace about them that surpasses all understanding. And we can just say, yeah, it's just because we trust that the Lord is near. And Father, I know that the only way we're ever going to be, all these words are connected. The only way we're going to be able to rejoice, the only way that we're going to be able to relax, the only way that we're going to be able to have a peace that surpasses all understanding is if we retreat, if we rest, if we hide in the shadow of your wings, if we take refuge under the banner of Jesus. So Father, help us retreat to pray. Help us retreat to think. Help us get practical in how we do this. How can our thoughts begin to change? How can our prayer lives begin to change? And maybe it's just one small step. Maybe it's just one small step. That's generally how you work. You bring us from glory to glory, from grace to grace. And Father, I pray that that happens in my life through your word that we heard tonight. I pray that that happens in the leaders' lives. I pray that happens in every student in here, that we could take one step closer to being the people that you have called us to be. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and let's sing this last song.